back to the moon. But you know, as a spaceport, we really have come into our own. We've really um, brought a lot of the commercial industry here to launch. Um, 97, uh, 94 launches on the manifest this year. Um, we had 57 last year, like you mentioned, 31 the year before that. So we are growing. We obviously are a very popular place, not just because of the geography, but the services that we're providing at the center to our commercial partners and customers. Um, we're working very hard to make it easy for them to launch and to provide them the best services. And I got to brag for a moment. Uh, we have a spaceport integration team. They coordinate with the um, uh, 45th, uh, SLD, the Space Force side, every single one of those 90 plus launches uh, will be supported by our Kennedy um, uh, team as well as the Space Force side. We work jointly together in partnership to ensure that all of those um, launches are successful and of that 90 plus, 79, uh, 79 are commercial. So a large, large number percentage of that is the commercial launches and so Across the board, we have our NASA, we have our government, we have our national um, space security missions we support, but we also have the commercial that we have to take care of also. Right, Janet. I mean, those numbers just really blow me away. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you, Jasmine. Of course. Always happy go, to have you. Go Crew 6. Uh, exactly. Go Crew 6. <laughs> Daryl, back to you. Thank you, Jasmine and Janet. Throughout the show, we've been taking your hashtag Ask NASA questions from social media. We have time for a few more before Falcon 9 fueling begins at T-minus 35 minutes. We're sitting now at 108 and counting. And Raja, there's the question. It seems like astronauts work on some really cool and interesting things other than flying. Raja, can you take a minute and talk about something interesting that you're working on right now. You're not flying, currently right. on a mission, obviously because you're here. So what <laughs> yeah. you working on? Yeah, so I'd say most of our time is not actually flying in space. So we do maintain the training for that, whether it's uh, NBL, which is the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, so doing uh, practice spacewalks in there, uh, whether it's working on the ISS systems, uh, working on uh, different experiments, getting smart on geology, biology. Uh, but we also all work on different projects in the office on the engineering and development program. So specifically, there's a whole lot of work going on in Artemis right now. Uh, the administrator talked about Artemis. That is, that is the goal of the agency to get us back to the moon to stay and go on to Mars. Uh, so there's the SLS, which is the rocket. There's the Orion, which is the capsule. Uh, there's the gateway, which is the lunar space station. And then there's the HLS, the human landing system, which is the lander. So that's my particular job right now is helping with uh, lunar lander development and testing. Uh, and so I, I, lo I love my job. I love, <laughs> I love to fly in space, but I also love my, my day job. And so that's, uh, you know, we're doing all different kinds of things. There's uh, folks working on the lunar exploration suits. So those are the space suits for the surface. So mm -hmm. we, we're not going to use, you know, we talked about there's IV suits, which are for in the vehicle. There's EVA suits, which is what we use on the space station. And we are working on lunar suits because those are, that's different than either of the ones we have. And so if we get to the moon, we are going there to do science. And so we need to get out there and go do the science. So that's another uh, big project that people are working on. Um, and yeah, so it's, uh, we are spread all over the place. Uh, training and working with all these development teams. Yeah, and it, and it seems like there's a similarity there to when, you know, Bob and Doug were working in the commercial crew program early on developing these vehicles. You're very early on in the HLS system, so, you know, it's uh, it's got to be kind of exciting to be working on the next thing that's going to land on the moon. Yeah, I think all of us enjoy it. That's why it's fun to do these things. You know, yeah. and our, our job is in the office is to fly in space, but also to bring the crew's perspective, the operational perspective, to all these programs and to uh, to these efforts to make sure that we're you know the the human is the important part of human space flight, and so keeping that in mind and, and keeping that at the forefront is always really important and, and that's why it's important to have us tied into all those programs. And for those of us, uh, for those of you who are watching and for those of us who are enjoying watching, if you want in on the social fun, follow us on Twitter at NASA Social or check us out on the web at nasa.gov forward slash social forward slash social. <laughs> hey, this is a really quick question, a really easy one. At Slow asks Raja. What inspires you? What inspires me? I think uh, the idea of exploring is what in inspires me, the idea of new discoveries. And I think I kind of alluded to why I'm so excited about science before, solving problems here on Earth. So I'd, I would love to see humanity go and explore, like live on the moon, go to the next planet. But I also am inspired by the fact that we're, we are finding solutions for problems here on Earth right now. So that's, uh, that's what inspires me to, to work here. And it must be rewarding as well. It's amazing, yeah. I, so I think it, what inspires me is inspiring others too. So I think one of the co coolest parts of our jobs, uh, it takes time and effort because it's you're traveling, but going to talk to like school kids, I, that's 
hands down one of my the most my most favorite things um, really? to go do and just yeah I mean seeing their excitement um, just the when an astronaut walks in the door it's just so fun you know and yeah. um, you know whether it's elementary answering bathroom questions you know, because <laughs> I've heard plenty uh, all, all, the way, all the way to you know talking to university students uh, where, who have questions like you know how do we like, where do I go and like what kind of degrees and you know, so it's it is uh, it is really cool um, and it's, it inspires me to be uh, even a potential inspiration or to potentially help or set a spark maybe uh, uh, in someone's mind or give them the idea of what's possible deep curiosity as well. We are one hour and four minutes and counting until liftoff. This day is the continuation of regular flights to the space station from U.S. soil. Crew 6 and the mission will be the company's sixth crewed space flight. This is for, of course, SpaceX and NASA following the crewed test flight Demo 2 and four previous operational crewed missions to the space station. It will also be SpaceX's eighth crewed space flight overall, including the private orbital mission Inspiration4. Today our crew is uh, flying on board Dragon Endeavor, and this will be the fourth flight for this capsule. It will be taking a ride on a brand new Falcon 9 rocket. The Dragon is the flight, this particular Dragon, Endeavor, is the flight leader in the fleet. Its fourth flight, which includes Demo 2, Axiom 1, it's been a great countdown so far. One hour and three minutes and counting. Weather is fantastic here at the Kennedy Space Center. Only a 5% chance of violation. That means 95% go. Doing some math here, getting inspired by my fellow astronaut here. Really advanced stuff. Avoid math in public. That's my rule. <laughs> That's a good idea. Excitement is picking up, though, as we get uh, closer to T0. And so with roughly about an hour, sorry. No, no, go ahead. About an hour to go until liftoff, things are going to start picking up. We get close to the go, no-go pole to arm the launch escape system and begin the propellant loading. The crew pole for readiness, that will happen right at T minus 60 minutes. And then the dragon pole for prop load is at T minus 55 minutes. From there, at T minus 45 minutes, there will be an internal mission control Hawthorne pole, and then the launch director's pole for propellant loading will follow. When we get to about T minus 40 minutes, the crew access arm will retract, and the crew will get the call to close their visors and to arm the launch escape system. We're going to walk you all the way through it. This is the automated safety system that's in place that can fire the eight Super Draco thrusters on Dragon to quickly separate the crew from the rocket either on the pad or during a flight on the ride uphill. And then, once we reach about T minus 35 minutes, propellant loading for the Falcon 9 will begin. Thanks for tuning in. You're watching live launch coverage of NASA and SpaceX's sixth rotational flight of astronauts and one cosmonaut to the International Space Station. We are T-minus one hour and counting until liftoff. And with us today is NASA astronaut Raja Chari. Raja, thanks for coming back. Yeah, glad to be back. Hoping to see my first launch. Indeed. And if you didn't know, Raja is getting ready to witness his first launch. He rode on a rocket as we turn the corner from the vehicle assembly building to show off the launch pad just beyond it. Oh, this is a great shot. Got the big reveal. Look at that. It certainly oh, is. Cool. There it is, the Launch Complex 39A, holding for a 12.34 a.m. Eastern Time liftoff. And so right now the crew is uh, going through kind of mentally, uh, you know, Probably looking forward to the prop Dragon timeline. SpaceX and you cycling orbit start tank to isolation valves to equalize low flow pressure. SpaceX 
dragon carpet for wash. Quickly explain what that is. So give them that call. So uh, a lot of times whenever they're going to do something with any prop loading or valves, they'll give the crew a heads up. So if they hear the sound or feel the vibration, that they know that that's planned. So they usually give them a call prior. Uh, you mentioned that it's about to get a lot busier on the loops as they start going through some go-no-go no go poles and uh, talking to the crew. And so they are looking ahead in what's called the event details, and they have probably two displays up, one that's event details, one that's in procedure 4.100. They're sitting in 4.100 waiting for the pole to say that they can arm the LES, the launch escape system. And on the timeline, they're probably looking at what the prop loading steps are and just kind of anticipating what's coming up next, probably scrolling ahead to kind of talk through the launch sequence and using this time to basically what we call chair fly, uh, talk through. Uh, Dragon SpaceX, you are go for section five. When ready, report go for launch. All right, picking up sector five, preparation for LES arming. All right, great insight into what's happening in Crew Dragon right now, but we want to recap the last three hours. Our crew of Stephen Bowen, Woody Hoberg, Sultan al Nayadi and Andrei Fediev have been getting ready to launch into space after waking up and having a meal. SpaceX helped the astronauts into their suits, and then you see them here walking out the historic crew quarters, walking the same path that every NASA astronaut has done since Apollo 7, waving to family and loved ones as well as to the cameras there to document their journey. Then you see them here inside their Teslas, joined in a caravan as they went down the road led by center security till they arrived here at Launch Complex 39A. They did the rocket recline, went up the tower and walked down the crew access arm here. Woody Hoberg and Stephen Bowen crawling into Crew Dragon. And then once inside, they got strapped in, got their suits checked, comm checks, and now we watch as the Dragon spacecraft sits on top of the Falcon 9 rocket, getting ready for fueling and arming of the launch escape system. At this time, we are expanding our coverage and would like to welcome SpaceX and NASA commentators who are joining us live from Hawthorne, California. Welcome to you both. Hey, thank you so much, Daryl, and hello to everybody watching around the world. I'm Gary Jordan with NASA's Communications. And I'm Jesse Anderson, a production and engineering manager here at SpaceX. Gary and I are joining you today from our headquarters in Hawthorne, California. While Crew-6 marks SpaceX's sixth operational mission for NASA, it's actually our eighth human spaceflight mission to the International Space Station and overall 34th Dragon mission to the orbiting laboratory. And the Dragon supporting tonight's mission will be making its fourth visit to the station, having previously supported Demo 2, Crew 2, and Axiom Mission 1. And speaking of Demo 2, the spacecraft was named Dragon Endeavor by Bob and Doug during its inaugural flight in May of 2020. And yet another fun fact, tonight's launch marks our four-year anniversary of the Demo 1 mission, which launched on the same day, just a couple of hours later than we're launching today, which served as an end-to-end -end test flight of Dragon's capabilities. Since Crew 1 in November of 2020, SpaceX has been regularly flying commercial crew missions for NASA to and from the International Space Station at an average cadence of about one flight every six months. It took a lot of love and dedication to get here today, and we are still learning and innovating from every launch. From the beginning, Dragon was designed to eventually fly people to help further our ultimate goal of making life multiplanetary. The Dragon hanging from the ceiling behind us was initially flown to certify SpaceX for cargo missions to the space station over 10 years ago. It flew back in 2010, but it included a window because the vehicle had been designed from the beginning to fly crew. We always knew that this was the direction that we wanted to go in. As we continue the countdown to liftoff, we'd like to welcome you to SpaceX Mission Control in Hawthorne. This is where our teams are staffed around the clock to monitor Dragon and the mission overall. On console or headset in Mission Control are six key positions. The mission director is in charge of the room and tasked with making real-time decisions to ensure mission success. The person that you may hear talking to the astronauts is the crew operations and resources engineer, who you'll hear us refer to as the core throughout the broadcast. And the four additional team members are focused on vehicle systems, including avionics, navigation and control, software, propulsion, life support, and communication with ground support teams. 
Apart from mission control, our Falcon 9 team is currently located in firing room four in the launch control center at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Now, with less than an hour until launch, they are settling in for final checkouts, propellant loading, and for launch. And then, of course, NASA has its own team members at NASA's Mission Control Center in Houston, Texas, who have been preparing the space station for Dragon's arrival. And they recently gave their go for launch, saying that the station is ready to receive the new crew. Upon liftoff, today's ride to the space station will take about 24 and a half hours, with Dragon flying autonomously the entire way. And just like autopilot on a commercial aircraft, the crew always has the ability to take manual control of the spacecraft if needed. Now at under T minus 55 minutes, we are looking good for an on-time liftoff and our very own incredible Kate Tice has been monitoring the progress of the countdown. How's it going so far, Kate? Thanks, Jesse. I'm Kate Tice, SpaceX Quality Systems Engineering Manager, bringing you vehicle status updates this evening. It's been a pretty smooth countdown so far. The Crew-6 astronauts wrapped up ingress at T minus two hours and 34 minutes. Since then, the teams completed the required comm checks, suit leak checks, and side hatch closure, as well as side hatch leak check. The closeout team has departed the BDA and the pad is clear. Now as for Falcon 9, our two-stage reusable rocket that you see there on your screen, final propulsion checkouts of first and second stages began a few minutes ago in preparation for propellant loading. This involves testing valves and engine pneumatic pressurization. Now, as you might be able to guess from the lack of re-entry soot on Falcon 9's first stage, which is the lower two-thirds of the vehicle there, that booster will be flying for the first time tonight. Now, at T-minus 45 minutes, less than 10 minutes from now, the team will report their readiness for prop load with a final electronic go-no-go pull. Before we can begin propellant loading on Falcon 9, we still have a couple tasks to perform. First, the crew access arm will be moved out of its service position as you see it in now, and it will rotate away from the Dragon capsule and over to its launch position. That will happen between T minus 44 and 42 minutes, almost immediately after the T minus 45 minute launch director's briefing. With the access arm out of the way, the launch escape system will then be armed. Once those two events are complete, Dragon will be ready for Falcon propellant loading. As for weather, we will also verify with the launch weather officer that all of the weather conditions meet our launch constraints. Those include items such as wind speed, lightning, and precipitation in the area surrounding pad 39A. But tonight, we're expecting uh, acceptable weather conditions for launch, both at surface level and upper altitudes. Uh, once again, our uh, probability of violation of those conditions is only 5%, so looking good. The range is currently clear for launch. A worldwide network of ground stations and tracking and data relay satellites, or TDRIS, are ready to support. And those are what help us get live views and data as Dragon heads into orbit. Today, we have an instantaneous launch window at 12.34 a.m. Hey. Eastern. As I've said before, once we begin propellant load, there is no opportunity to change the T0. The timing for Dragon to rendezvous with the International Space Station is down to the exact second. So today we only get one chance. But the good news at T minus 51 minutes and 32 seconds, uh, we and counting, uh, we are go for launch. Great news, thanks, Kate. Today's launch marks the sixth time a rotational crew will fly on a commercial spacecraft. And much like our previous crews, today's crew has been training with our teams at SpaceX for the last several months, running nominal and emergency simulations of what the full mission will look like while seated inside of Dragon. And as with every mission, each one of our crew members brings a diverse set of experience to today's flight. That's right, and let's start with the mission's commander. Steve Bowen was born in Cohasset, Massachusetts. He holds a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the U.S. Naval Academy and a master's in ocean engineering from the Joint Program in Applied Ocean Science and Engineering at MIT and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. In July 2000, Boeing became the first submarine officer selected as an astronaut by NASA. This will be Boeing's fourth trip into space as a veteran of three space shuttle missions, STS-126 in 2008, STS-132 in 2010, and STS-133 in 2011. Bowen has logged more than 40 days in space, including 47 hours, 18 minutes during seven spacewalks. As mission commander, he'll be responsible for all phases of flight aboard Dragon from launch to reentry. 
Warren Woody Hoberg is from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He earned a bachelor's degree in aeronautics and astronautics from MIT and a doctorate in electrical engineering and computer science from the University of California, Berkeley. He is also a commercial pilot with instrument, single engine, and multi-engine ratings. The mission will be Hoberg's first flight since his selection as an astronaut in 2017. As pilot, he will be responsible for spacecraft systems and performance on Dragon. Sultan Al-Niadi will be making his first trip to space, representing the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center of the United Arab Emirates. Aboard Dragon, he'll serve as a mission specialist, working to monitor the spacecraft during the dynamic launch and re-entry phases of flight. He spent time in the UAE military prior to becoming one of the first two individuals selected by his country when they started their space program just a few years ago in 2017. Al-Niadi will be the first UAE astronaut to fly on a commercial spacecraft. Andre Fedyaev will be making his first trip to space and will also serve as a mission specialist monitoring the spacecraft during the dynamic launch and re-entry phases of flight. He was selected as a cosmonaut in 2012 and will be the second cosmonaut to fly aboard a SpaceX Dragon. Each of these crew members will be a part of Expedition 68 upon their arrival to the International Space Station. Now let's head over to Kate Tice for another status update on the countdown. How's it going, Kate? Thanks, Jesse. Uh, we're coming up to T minus 48 minutes and 40 seconds. The SpaceX launch teams are finishing final review of data from all the checkouts of Falcon 9 over the last hour. The launch director has confirmed with the launch weather officer that weather meets propellant loading constraints. So up next will be to pull the team for readiness, both to load propellant and to launch. That will be the final pull prior to liftoff. The seven SpaceX responsible engineers, often called RE's, indicate that they are go by electronically voting on the online countdown procedure. The launch director, or LD, also checks with the Dragon mission director, MD, and the NASA launch manager to make sure they are ready. Earlier, you saw the vehicle assembly building called the VAB. The Falcon and Dragon launch team, uh, as well as key NASA launch members, are in the launch control center adjacent to the VAB. You can actually see where they are right now on the right-hand side of your screen. They have a view straight towards pad 39A through those large windows of firing room four. On your screen, you see there the Dragon capsule with the crew access arm still in the service position. The crew is on board Dragon waiting for the next instructions, which will be to stow the crew arm for launch and to arm the launch escape system. Once the launch director gives the final instructions to the launch team in that T minus 45 minute briefing, uh, immediately afterward, the crew arm sequence, uh, excuse me, the crew access arm sequence will be armed and initiated. We should get a good view of that access arm as it swings away from the capsule. That will take about two minutes to complete its rotation to move out of the way. The range continues to be go for launch. They continue to monitor uh, the clearance area around the launch pad, as well as the air and sea space around that uh, downward uh, uh, upstream or uh, the flight corridor downstream from uh, the launch pad. As we mentioned before, we have to make sure that uh, all areas are secure in the unlikely event of a, an abort. There at Kennedy Space Center, the conditions are predicted to be acceptable for launch. Um, you can, if we had daylight, you'd be able to see that uh, conditions are pretty calm. There's uh, 13 mile per hour winds from the south southwest, uh, so pretty mild all in all. The downrange landing zones, as I mentioned before, are also within uh, the conditions as needed, uh, if needed for an escape. So everything also looking go downrange. Now, in about a minute, we will hear the uh, briefing from the launch director. As I mentioned before, uh, the readiness poll that is uh, underway is the final go for propellant load and for launch. There on screen, you can see the four crew members of Crew 6 waiting patiently to go to space. Not much for them to do at this moment, but wait for that LD briefing, which will be coming up in about 35 seconds. As I mentioned before, the team in um, Mission Control, as well as the teams in 
firing room four. They are basically collectively, both with NASA launch team and the Dragon launch team and the Falcon Pull launch team. Pull is complete team. and the team is ready for crew access arm retract, propellant load, and launch. Both control rooms are going to lock down at T minus 45 minutes and remain in that state until the launch escape system is disarmed. All operators are remain at their console and maintain a sterile cockpit until MD confirms successful disarming the launch escape system following orbit insertion or propellant offload in the event of a scrub. For non-urgent no-go conditions, brief the CE or LD and they'll approve aborting the countdown. For urgent issues affecting the safety of the operation, operators shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. Launch control will abort the launch auto sequence immediately and proceed into the launch abort sequence. At T minus 10 seconds, launch control will be hands off, relying on automated abort criteria for the remainder of the count. Launch control, you may proceed with arming the crown for movement. There we heard that final go for launch and prop load from launch director having. I'd go arm, so get started. And there we just heard the call out that the crew access arm retraction is underway. So let's head back to Daryl over at Kennedy as they have a live view of that retraction as it happens and uh, will be the major final physical reconfiguration of the pad prior to launch. Daryl, how's it going? Great, Kate, and uh, thank you very much as we watch the crew access arm move quickly at first and then rotate away from the Dragon spacecraft, there's the view from inside the crew access arm, the white room at the very end of it. As we can see, uh, the water tower out there. Hitting another milestone here, Raja, on our way to liftoff. Yep, and the, and the crew is definitely tracking through all this on a, the timeline. Um, so they're uh, procedurally in 4.100, uh, following that SpaceX is retracting the crew arm and then starting to prepare uh, for the next big step they'll be taking is launching, or sorry, arming the launch escape system. And then looking forward uh, on the timeline to basically go through the steps for the prop loading. So we talked a little bit about the first, uh, the first broadcast, but uh, there's kind of a key mental note here as well. If there was an emergency pad aggress, uh, they probably have some crew coordination of who's going to get to the hatch first, but you definitely want to make sure the crew arm is back in place. So there's this period of time while well, the crew access arm is not there, the launch escape system is not armed. So crew you, access arm retraction complete. You need the arm to swing back to the capsule before you can actually egress. So you need to make sure that's there before you, you step out critically important and we got some beautiful views from our flight operations team which is not only uh, making sure that uh, the area around the rocket is safe uh, but also giving us some spectacular views of that crew access arm uh, as it uh, retracted away from the rocket and there it is again right there. Yeah, it's a, it's a great view where you can see the, the, both the strong back which is the structural piece uh, holding the rocket uh, up there now and then the crew access arm swung back open now to the air and the atmosphere. Hopefully no dragonflies that far <laughs> up. And we had our own dragonflies earlier, Raj. So we're, we're working. We're, yeah, we're, we, we have successfully had good luck here at the, the launch broadcast test. Okay, We've done our part. It's feeling good. We're doing it exactly doing what we can. There's a great view, too, of the trunk. So you can see the side, which is the part just below the capsule. That's got the, the avionics radiators for cooling. Uh, and then the left side that looks black in the picture here is actually the solar panels that generates the power for the, uh, the capsule on orbit. Curious, it looks like we saw a plane off there in the distance and it could be pretty well off given it's dark and night. That might have been the helo out there potentially ah, too. Ah, very good, good call. The countdown, T minus 41 minutes and counting and uh, we're heading down to a launch time of 12.34 a.m. We saw the retraction, that's the last major visual milestone as we prepare for liftoff. Shortly thereafter, we should hear the call out that the launch escape system is armed. And then from there, Raja, we will hear that F9 prop load has started. Yep, and yeah, timeline-wise, I'd expect probably about uh, another minute and a half or two, they'll, uh, they'll tell the crew to 
Uh, they'll tell them to go ahead and step into the arming. Um, you'll see them putting visors down. You'll probably see them tugging at the restraint straps, just making sure everything is uh, extra tight, making sure you saw like Andre before was using his uh, stylus to probably edit some of the, the weather data they had on their iPad. They'll stow all those things and basically put themselves in a posture uh, where you could, you see them stowing it right now, um, where you could be in a posture where if the capsule were to initiate a launch escape, you'd be prepared for that. So from the time that is hot, you are pretty much sitting on a, uh, a live uh, set of Super Dracos that could go off automatically if the vehicle senses a malfunction once the prop loading starts or it could be manual initiated. So you always want to be ready once that system's hot. Well, Raja, you say it and then we see it. <laughs> Calling it out. Remember well from your time as the commander of Crew 3. It's yeah. worth noting, you just came back from space. It was, what, May of last year? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's good to, good to be back. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd go back in a heartbeat, but it's also good to be back home. But oh, you're watching your friends go up? Yeah, this is... Uh, it's really surreal to have uh, you know friends and colleagues on the end of that rocket, and I think uh, you know it just reinforces the importance. You asked earlier, and the the, the the question was like, what do we do on our normal job? There's also people in our office. Uh, so Joe, who's the chief of the office, goes to the the launch trainers reviews, and you know you are signing up your friends to go ride this thing. So we take it pretty seriously as well. We should. You can kinda, strapped in. Yep, you can see just by Andre's left leg, the red of that bag. We were talking about that earlier, but you couldn't Dragon see it. Dragon SpaceX, go for Section 6, close visors, arm launch escape system. All right, we're picking up Section 6 on uh, closing the visors and, launch, and arming the launch escape system. All right, so you see them reaching up to the displays. They're stepping to that section of the procedure all verbalizing now with the visors down, that the Vox settings are correct so they can hear each Space other. Next, Dragon, visors are closed, we're arming the launch escape system. They have some telemetry on their display that shows them what the automatic thresholds are to make sure they're not violating one of those thresholds before they arm the system. We talked about that earlier tonight, um, to make sure you don't inadvertently initiate a launch escape. And then we also talked about the flight computer state, so that's what they're watching to actually know. So you actually hear the thunks because those valves that isolate the Super Dracos are in the capsule. So you can actually see like, where that NASA worm is and where the, the U.S. flag is. Yeah, those are the engines. Those are the yeah, engines. Yeah, yeah. So you're, they're right by your head on the inside. So when you arm it, you can actually hear the sound of the valves opening up. And that's what allows prop to flow to the Super Dracos in mm. the event of a launch escape. Can you hear the prop flow as well? Uh, well, hopefully you never hear that sound. <laughs> oh, no, okay, so it, it doesn't bleed in the system? No, but, okay. no. It just opens the valve. Launch escape yeah. system is verified armed. There's the verification yeah. of arming of the launch escape system. Right on time with our milestones as we count down. And so for the crew, they're now closing out 4.100, which is their launch preparation uh, procedure. And they're now stepping ahead to what's the, the prop loading timeline on their displays, which is going to give them times of when is the, the different tanks are pressurizing and loading. There's no telemetry in the Dragon that tells you what the F-9 tanks have in them in terms of amount of fuel. You can see what's in the Dragon, but not the F-9. And so you rely on this timeline and the calls uh, from the team to know the status, and that gives you an indication based on the timeline you have of things are behind or ahead uh, or on timeline. The team on the ground can certainly see. Yes, absolutely, yeah. The ground team can see that all, uh, but that's not all piped into the Dragon. Tank for propellant load. I'll start venting. These would be the tanks on the ground? Right, so the, the, as they start to, the, they have what's called these giant accumulators that are full of the fuel that they then pump into the, into the, drag, into the F9. And the, the two things I learned on our, our first broadcast attempt, one is that the license plate changes every time. The, <laughs> the second that I also learned from you is that you can tell out here how full the rocket is by looking at the level that the condensation comes off the outside of the rocket, which you, uh, yeah, you can't see that on the inside, but that's a, a good technique for if you're watching on the outside and don't have the benefit of having the displays the crew has or the telemetry the ground has to just get a look at binoculars if you're standing on the causeway or on TV and know how full the tank is. Outdoor fuel gauge. Yeah. Only wow. if you launch in the humidity of Florida. I don't know if it'd work <laughs> in the desert as well. But. Well, we get, to want, we get to see launches out at Vandenberg, California, and uh, it's a little drier out there. It still is on the coast, so we have some humidity. But uh, it is quite a sight. 
It's a definite pro tip. I, I didn't know that. I've been oh well. <laughs> I've been in the I, office for five years. Uh, no, no one taught me that. Told so. an astronaut something. Yeah. No, I'm feeling proud. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you what, you haven't learned nearly as much as I've learned in my time uh, being in these two uh, launch attempts. And so happy you could come back and count this down. We know our astronauts all around the country are watching. Checked in with Megan MacArthur earlier. Had a nice little chat with her. She's watching. Other astronauts from the core. The astronaut core is roughly, what, about 42 astronauts? Yep, about that, yep. And then a, a new class called, the, they're named the Flies, the 2021 the class. The Flies, they, about, that's about their name? halfway through their training, yep. And looking okay. forward to, they're cr crushing it, as you would expect. Started. And there's the call from the core. Yeah, here we go. So at this point, <clears throat> all the closeout crew is not only off the tower, but outside what's called the exclusion zone or the hazard area, or the different words for it. Basically, the, the radius away from the launch pad uh, since there's now prop flowing into the rocket. Well, T-minus 34 minutes and counting until liftoff. Today we will begin the next six-month rotation mission to the International Space Station. As we've been documenting, we heard the launch escape system armed happened just before that propellant load began. Dragon capsule, it was loaded with its propellants about a week and a half ago, just a few miles down the road. In order to fly, Dragon needs a fuel and an oxidizer for the fuel. SpaceX uses monomethyl hydrazine, or what they call MMH, and nitrogen tetroxide, or NTO, for oxidizer. And together, these propellants feed those Draco engines that will maneuver Dragon on orbit. It also feeds those eight Super Draco engines you were talking about that would power the launch escape system in an abort scenario. And so with that fueling having begun, that means those eight Super Draco engines inside Crew Dragon are ready. We heard, or rather Raja, relayed that the astronauts can hear those valves turning, getting that system ready to go should there be any kind of emergency associated with the rocket or the pad. Of course, NASA and SpaceX teams, they train extensively for exactly that type of contingency. And so with T-minus 33 minutes and counting, let's head back over to SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California for an operations update from Kate Tice. Kate? Thanks, Daryl. I continue to follow along with the final minutes of the launch countdown, heading for on-time launch just under 33 minutes from now. Everything's still looking good for Dragon and Falcon 9. No major issues reported by the teams at this time. As we heard on the loops, the launch escape system is now armed and Falcon 9 propellant loading uh, began at T minus 35 minutes. The first and second stages of Falcon 9 are each loaded with two liquid propellants. One is oxidizer, loaded into a tank at the top of each stage. The other, a fuel, loaded into a tank at the bottom of each stage. The fuel that we use to power the Merlin engines is RP-1, which is a refined kerosene. The oxidizer loaded on each stage is densified liquid oxygen, or LOX. Densified means it is kept much colder than typical for launch vehicles and takes up less volume, which allows for more oxidizer to be loaded into the first and second stages. And as Raja mentioned mo minutes ago, you can tell how full the tanks are based on how high the condensation appears on the outside of the vehicle. To ignite the fuel and oxidizer in the Merlin rocket engine, we use the ignition fluids of triethyl aluminum and triethyl boron, also called TTEB. When TTEB comes into contact with oxygen, it burns and produces a green colored flame. Once we have the flame going, we add the kerosene fuel into the Merlin chamber and the engine ramps up to full power. You might see the green flash just as the second stage engine ignites following stage separation two minutes and 48 seconds into flight. Now, for those of you who have been following along, you'll know that we stood down from our initial launch attempt of Crew-6 on February 26th due to a TTEB ground system issue. It was determined to be the result of a clogged ground system filter that was impeding the flow of TTEB. SpaceX teams replaced the filter, purged the TTEB line with nitrogen, and verified the lines are ready for launch. 
Lastly, we're topping helium. Uh, off, we're topping off helium into pressure vessels on both the on both stages. Um, that is actually used to pressurize the tanks in flight as the propellant is pulled out and consumed by the Merlin engines. Um, it's very similar to when you're drinking from a plastic Stage water bottle. Helium loading has started. And there's that call for that cryo helium load I was just talking about. Um, it's similar to drinking out of a plastic water bottle. You got to let some air back into the bottle to keep it from crumpling. Now, on board the spacecraft, the astronauts are monitoring the systems while propellants are loaded into the Falcon 9 below them, as you can see on the right-hand side of your screen. The crew's training in the simulator here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, actually included playback of sounds recorded in Dragon capsules uh, during recent flights. So all of the sounds that they're hearing now, um, not only did they hear before in our previous launch attempt, but they heard it uh, during the training simulations as well. As for the range, they continue to report no problems and they are go to support launch. Weather also looks great. Uh, as I mentioned before, our probability of violation uh, for the launch constraints uh, is only 5%, so really good on that front. As a reminder, today we have an instantaneous launch time. So at this point, if we hear a hold for any reason, uh, we will have to stand down and target our backup launch opportunity tomorrow, just under 24 hours from tonight's planned launch. At this point in time, at just under T minus 29 and a half minutes, I'll turn it back over to Jesse and Gary for an overview of events that we'll see after liftoff. Awesome, thanks, Kate. For crew six, the astronauts' flight to station will take about 24 and a half hours. And as we wait for that T0 mark coming up in just about 29 minutes, the ground operations teams are doing a system series of system checks to make sure that both the Dragon and the Falcon 9 are ready for launch. You're going to be looking at a live view of our teams at the Cape as they prepare for liftoff. Now, as we wait for that launch clock to hit zero, we wanted to give you an overview of what the ascent portion of that mission is going to look like. Once we hit T0 and a successful launch occurs, we will watch Falcon 9 and Dragon lift off from historic launch pad 39A and make their ascent. At about 50 seconds into flight, Falcon 9 engines will throttle down to ha help pass through the period of maximum dynamic pressure on the rocket, or what we typically refer to as max Q. It's worth noting that once we hit that max Q point, the vehicle will be going supersonic. Once we are through the period of maximum dynamic pressure, we can throttle up our nine Merlin engines again. From there, at about two and a half minutes into flight, we have a series of three events that will happen in rapid succession. First is MECO, or main engine cutoff. This is where all nine Merlin 1D engines shut off in preparation for stage separation, which is our second event. This is where the first stage detaches from the second stage, with the first stage making its way back to Earth from landing, as the second stage continues on its journey with the third event, SES-1, or second stage engine start number one, where the MVAC engine lights up and propel propels the second stage, along with our Crew-6 astronauts, into orbit. As stage two heads towards its targeted drop-off orbit, stage one will execute two burns in order to make its way back down home on Earth. The first is the entry burn. That's where three of the M1D engines will reignite and then shut down again. Now this helps to slow the stage down in preparation for entry back into the Earth's atmosphere. And while the first stage is heading back to Earth, the second stage will cut off its one Merlin engine that was ignited right after stage separation. Once this happens, we'll wait for a confirmation of a good orbital insertion. About 90 seconds after Dragon gets into orbit, Falcon 9 will land back on Earth. The landing burn is just a single engine burn, but it's powerful enough to bring the vehicle speed down rapidly in order to land on our drone ship at about nine and a half minutes into the mission. And while the Falcon 9 first stage is landing, Dragon is preparing to separate from the second stage. At about three minutes after the second stage gets into orbit, we should have a great view of Dragon with its four-person crew drifting away from the second stage. Once Dragon is a short distance away, it'll begin checking out its Draco maneuvering thrusters to make sure Dragon continues to increase separation distance from the second stage. It's worth noting that these are not the super Draco engines that would be used during an abort scenario. About 40 seconds after separation, Dragon's nose cone deploy sequence will begin. It will take roughly four minutes for the nose cone hooks to unlatch and open, exposing its guidance navigation controls that will help Dragon autonomously fly to the space station. 
And lastly, once the nose cone is deployed, the remaining Draco thrusters on the forward bulkhead will be checked. From there, over the next 24-ish hours, Dragon will be in its rendezvous and approach phases, undergoing a number of phasing burns as it makes its way to station. All of that will be coming up soon, but for now, let's check back in with Courtney in Mission Control, Houston. Courtney. Thanks, Gary. The flight controllers here in Mission Control Houston are laser-focused on the onboard systems of the space station, ensuring it is ready to receive Crew Dragon. They're also making sure communication links between the station, Dragon, and the ground are working properly, and the consensus to this point is that everything is proceeding right on track. Teams here in Mission Control Houston, the team in Hawthorne, and the astronauts aboard the space station will monitor the autonomous docking of the Dragon spacecraft on Friday. They'll perform a series of leak checks, then work to open the hatches on both the Dragon side and inside the station's pressurized mating adapter. We expect hatch opening to take place about an hour and a half after docking. Once on board, the astronauts will be greeted by the space station crew and will then join in for welcoming remarks for the new crew members. From there on out, they will no longer be referred to as Crew 6, but rather as flight engineers of the International Space Station until their return back to Earth. Here at Mission Control Houston, Flight Director Judd Freeling is on console overseeing the team for launch. And that's it from here in Mission Control Houston, so I'll toss it back to the team in Florida. Daryl, how's it looking? We're looking great out here, Courtney, and thank you very much as we cruise around the set here. Our production team doing a great job showing us all the sights and the sounds of the countdown of Crew 6. Liftoff is at 12.34 a.m. Eastern Time, and if you're just joining us, well, we're doing well. We're having a great countdown, 24 minutes to go for the sixth astronaut rotation mission to the International Space Station under NASA's Commercial Crew Program. Commander Stephen Bowen, Pilot Woody Hoberg, and Mission Specialist Sultan al Niyadi and Andrei Fedyev are strapped into the seats, as you can see them here inside Dragon Endeavor. The Falcon 9 rocket fueling operation well underway. The launch escape system is armed. That means Dragon is prepared to launch itself away from the Falcon 9 in case of an emergency on the pad or after liftoff. So far, operations looking and sounding as we would expect. And you can see on the rocket, we're filling her up. The condensation of the warm, humid Florida air down there shows you that uh, well, my guess would be about a third, <laughs> but uh, I have no actual <laughs> uh, telemetry to tell me that. Just going by uh, the condensation coming off the rocket. It really super chills the skin on the outside of the rocket, and then that, uh, that uh, you know, condenses the air in the atmosphere, the water that's in the air. And it really is something to look at once it's ready to go, all the way up and down the rocket. And, and the reason we make it, they make it super cold is that, uh, you know, if there's probably, let's see, third or fourth graders out there, I know that's what my kids are learning about. It's like when something's really cold, it gets dense, so you can get more of it in there. So that's why it's important. You Every drop of gas matters when you're trying to get to orbit. Every You want as much margin. John was talking before about uh, why we build the timelines we do, and so, you know we always hope everything goes nominally, but we train for all kinds of contingencies. And so, um, you know, we've been talking about launch, launch escapes, but the, the next phase is rendezvousing with the space station. And so we protect for, you know, a problem with either the station or the capsule and having to, you know, back away and come back again in 24 hours. And so all that requires prop and gas and the further and higher the F-9 can get the Dragon, the more options we have. So that's why, that's why they chill the gas. You heard calls earlier about the cryohelium, um, and like they talked about it uh, out at Hawthorne, that means that, that we have enough gas to pressurize the tanks. Uh, and then next you'll start tearing probably in about another minute. They'll start talking about uh, stage two fuel being loaded. And so you'll hear calls, uh, you'll talk, hear them talk about stage two and stage one, it's a two-stage rocket. So there's fuel and oxidizer for both the stages. Um, the first stage, like they described, having the nine engines and the, the second stage having one, but both of those require, have separate tanks for the fuel and oxidizer. And they'll, you'll hear them calling those out. Because again, the crew, um, 
probably can't as much hear it like the same way they hear the Super Draco valves, but you can hear uh, sort of some creaking and some noises, uh, some definitely some vibrations. So getting a call before that happens just kind of reassures them that that sound is expected and gives them a reference point on the time that they're following. We're about 37 seconds away from completing stage two, RP1 load. In the meantime, let's tell you about the crew. The commander of Crew 6 is Captain Stephen G. Bowen. He hails from Cohasset, Massachusetts. Married with three children, holds the title of first U.S. Navy submarine officer to be selected as a mission specialist by NASA. Captain Bowen is also a veteran of NASA space flights, including the space shuttle flights on STS-126, 132, and 133, the only astronaut to ever go consecutive back-to-back -back shuttles. Sitting next to Stephen is pilot Warren Woody Hoburn, the 37-year-old from Pittsburgh. He studied aeronautics and astronautics from MIT before getting a doctorate in electrical engineering and a computer science uh, degree from the University of California, Berkeley. During grad school, Hoburg worked as an EMT with the Yosemite Yer Search and Rescue. Crew 6 will be Stage Hoburg's... Stage 2, RP-1 load complete. And there's that load complete. Stage 2 is in the books. Loaded up. And now you can see the venting off of that... Uh, liquid oxygen. Talking about Hoberg, this flight will be his first flight since NASA selected him to be an astronaut along with Rajachari's class in 2017, the Turtles. In the role of mission specialist is astronaut Sultan Al Niyadi. He was chosen by the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center of the United Arab Emirates to be a part of Expeditions 6869. The father of five spent most of his life in Al Ain and Abu Dhabi. But in 2020, traded that in for astronaut training in Houston at NASA's Johnson Space Center. This will be his first trip to space. To space. And it's also the first trip for second mission specialist, Roscosmos cosmonaut Andrei Fedyev. He will be working to monitor the spacecraft during the dynamic launch and reentry phases of flight. He will be a flight engineer for Expedition 68 just turned 42 years of age. Each of these four crew members will be part of Expedition 68 once they arrive at the International Space Station. T minus 18 minutes and counting. We had strong back chill that began. And coming up in just a few minutes, we'll start loading liquid oxygen onto the second stage. And I think a, a great testament to the international partnerships of this program. Half the crew is, you know, international. Sultan being the first uh, UAE astronaut to launch on a U.S. vehicle from the U.S. to have trained at Johnson Space Center. Um, an amazing, uh, you know, completion of the partnership that started several years ago, and taking that now all the way to completion. Um, and just great to see, you know. NASA and space exploration being just this great unifier uh, for the world, uh, especially as you know, there's low Earth orbit, but then we look beyond that to Artemis and, and Mars and just the, the collaboration and the work to do such hard things and really pulling together the best of, of all, our, all the nations. And the partnership of those nations rises above all else. And That's, it's, yeah. uh, it's impressive, the camaraderie of the crews in space with their international backgrounds. So that venting, so we talked about there's two things happening. In the Dragon case. SpaceX, F9 is proceeding with prop load, and we're tracking no issues with Dragon or F9 going into launch. SpaceX Dragon copies. So an update from the core that's on track. So we talked about the condensation a few times, and there's also the venting, so two different processes. The condensation is the super chilled fuel cooling the, the metal and the skin around it. The venting is because it's super cold as it heats up on the inside just from the air temperature you know essentially working its way in there it vents and so that's just like a pot boiling um, and just like you would you know lift the lid off a tea kettle to let the pressure out uh, this is the same thing you're seeing happen there so that's what's happening kind of from the middle of the screen yeah and, and on a calm night like tonight the winds have totally died down you can see it as it cascades down like a waterfall coming off uh, the middle of uh, the strong back there want to make a quick note about the, the radio and how you can hear, if you're on uh, local amateur radio on the VHF radio frequency, turn into 146.940 megahertz and UHF radio frequency 444.925 megahertz on the FM mode. You can hear this all around Page the space coast. Has started. 
And there goes our stage two locks load on a beautiful night on the coast of central Florida. For stage one, that's going to continue to load and we'll see that go all the way down to T minus six minutes in terms of uh, the RP1 load. In terms of locks, that will continue until about T minus three to two minutes on the liquid oxygen side. A lot more volume, of course, in the first stage. Hey, let's throw up a quick social media question. What do you say, Raj? Sounds good. What do we got here? At JSE Garen asks, oh, I am nine years old and want to know if you can see airplanes on the ISS. I have never heard that question. So actually, uh, Megan uh, MacArthur had a cool post where she took a picture of the ground and you can see the contrails of a plane. So you can't see a plane if it's not what we call conning, meaning contrails. You can, if you can find the contrails, then you can follow it back to find the plane, but it's super hard to find an actual airplane that's not in the contrails. Um, we also spent some time on Crew 3 trying to see who could one-up each other to find ships. Uh, so you can cheat and look around the Panama Canal uh, to see if you could find ships there, but <laughs> you, you need binoculars to help yourself. But if you know where to look uh, or along the shipping lanes, you can usually find some from ships. And then airplanes, if you look around uh, like the places like over the Atlantic where you can look for contrails and find planes, but absolutely you can see them. What a great answer. Didn't know that. Thank you, Raj. Let's head out to Kate Tice now. Thanks, Daryl. Everything's still looking good for launch of Falcon 9 and Dragon Endeavor just under 15 minutes from now. Now, for those just tuning in, Falcon 9 began propellant load at T minus 35 minutes. Around T minus 20 minutes, Falcon 9 completed loading of RP1 fuel on the second stage. Fuel loading on the first stage remains underway. Um, and it is approximately 80% uh, full. Um, it will finish around T minus six minutes. Falcon 9 is also underway with loading of densified liquid oxygen. Uh, and that will wrap up at T minus three minutes uh, for the first stage and T minus two minutes for the second stage. Coming up, we'll perform checkouts of the thrust vector controllers, a procedure called TVC wiggles. We'll command Falcon 9 to activate those thrust vector controllers and actually wiggle the engines a couple degrees. This verifies that those engines will be able to move while in flight, which is how Falcon 9 steers itself during the ascent phase. Dragon mission director and team reporting no issues. Communication checkouts are complete, the crew access arm is retracted, and the launch escape system is armed. And as you can see there uh, on the right-hand side of your screen, the crew is strapped in and ready to go to space. Everybody looks pretty calm and chill, uh, you know, given that they are going to space in uh, 13 minutes. <laughs> Final instructions to the crew will come at T minus 10 minutes. The crew displays will be configured for launch, which give the crew insight into how the launch is proceeding and provides constant updates on vehicle health. At T minus five minutes, we'll then be in terminal count and Dragon will transition to internal power. We'll hear continued status callouts from SpaceX mission control as we get closer to liftoff. The range is go, all secured air and sea space remain clear, and as you can see, weather, weather remains gorgeous, uh, and everything still remains inbound for the launch criteria. So all in all, Falcon 9 and Dragon Endeavor, all systems remain go for launch in just 12 minutes and 34 seconds from now. All right, thank you very much, Kate. And take a look at this picture. Before their flight, Crew-6 got a picture with what was supposed to be their booster. Actually got swapped out for a brand new booster, but anytime you get that close to the hardware, it's a cool thing. Brand new booster launching tonight. And at the time Falcon 9 and Dragon launches, the International Space Station, which is being tracked right here by Mission Control, will be 260 statute miles over the Bristol Channel, southwest of Cardiff, Wales. Crew 6, once they get off the ground, will spend the next 25 hours chasing down the International Space Station for a rendezvous at 1.11 a.m. Eastern Time tomorrow. It'll be Friday. And we'll have live coverage on NASA TV of docking and the Crew 6 welcome ceremony at 11 p.m. Eastern Time tonight. 
Final right. thoughts, Raja, yep, so, get ready to lift off. Yeah, so right here, they're uh, at 10 minutes. They'll probably say some thank yous to the ground. Uh, a lot of people got them here. Uh, they're, you're going to see them messing with the displays. So Woody and Steve will be putting up what's called forward views on the outside displays so the mission specialists can monitor the parameters. That's how they monitor anything that would uh, how the performance is doing. In the center display, they'll bring up the event details uh, that show the launch, and you'll see them put their hands down once they get closer to launch, and they'll have this display up so they can basically watch. They'll have everything configured, and that's what they talk about configuring for launch so that you don't have to touch it during the launch itself. Colonel Chari putting us in the seat of the astronauts with exactly what they're doing. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And one more thing I want to say. I don't know, Raja. I have a feeling there's love in the air. Not going <laughs> to give it away, but it just feels like there's love in the air. you got to stay tuned to find out more about that. For now, we'll turn it over to Gary and Kate at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. Take us through the rest of the countdown. Thanks, Daryl. That's right. We're exactly t minus 10 and a half minutes until liftoff of Crew 6. Uh, as you can see there on your screen, Falcon 9 is underway with propellant loading, as indicated uh, by those white clouds forming around the vehicle. Uh, the fuel loading is complete on the second stage. LOX load remains underway. It's about 40% full on the second stage. Lox load also underway. Dragon, SpaceX confirmed crew displays configured for launch. SpaceX Dragon crew displays are configured for launch. Copy that, Steve. And once again, on behalf of the entire SpaceX team, we're honored to have you aboard Dragon Capsule Endeavor on its next trip to the International Space Station. We wish you a great mission, good luck, Godspeed, and enjoy the ride. And thanks again to everyone out there who made the vehicle, the ISS, our mission, and our crew ready for launch. Really want to thank everyone and appreciate the uh, great call, much appreciated call for the scrub the other night. Uh, it was a great uh, call and a good learning opportunity for the crew and I think for the teams. And uh, so once more to the breach, dear friends, Crew 6 is ready to launch. Some nice words there between the crew, as you see there on your screen, and SpaceX Core, uh, located here at SpaceX Mission Control, which a live view uh, there on your screen. As you can tell by perhaps the, the ambient noise around me, the energy is starting to grow uh, in anticipation for launch coming up about eight and a half minutes from now. That's right, the energy is high here, Kate. Now at that T minus 10 minute mark, we heard the good luck and Godspeed from the teams here in Mission Control in Hawthorne, where that crowd is gathering. Meanwhile, we're tracking the loading of fuel and oxidizer on the first and second stage. Second stage filled with fuel right now, continuing to fill with oxidizer. It'll be the last of the tanks to fill. Stage one continuing to be underway. At the 10 minute mark, you heard that call for configuring the uh, crew displays for launch that was confirmed. At the T-minus 10 minute mark, it also is a point where Falcon 9 launch commit criteria gets checked by the computers past that milestone. Now we're counting down to the next milestone at T-minus seven minutes, which is setting up for engine chill. That's right, we should hear that call out in about 44 seconds. Um, at T-minus seven minutes, we will actually open up um, the pre-valves to the M1D engines, those nine engines at the base of the first stage. Um, that will allow a little bit of that super chilled, densified liquid oxygen to flow into the hardware, the, those turbo pumps. And that basically helps prepare the hardware from a thermal standpoint or a temperature standpoint uh, for that full flow of super chilled liquid oxygen. So um, we basically open up the pre-valves and a little bit of that locks flows in and helps cool the hardware down in preparation for full flow of liquid oxygen. Engine chill has started. And as expected, there's that call out for that engine chill, indicating the pre-valves are open and the engines are beginning to prepare for liftoff. Now under six minutes, 45 seconds from launch, again, we're continuing to fuel the Falcon 9 rocket, stage two filled with the RP-1 kerosene. 
At the T minus six minute mark, we should hear a call out that the stage one RP load is complete. They're just topping that off. Liquid oxygen on both the first and second stages stage one, come next. RP one load complete. And there's that confirmation. We're counting down to T minus five minutes at this point. At T minus, at T minus five, the, dr the dragon continue is configured for terminal count. And at terminal count, dragon is switched to internal power. Right now, receiving power from umbilical lines from the ground. Also, at uh, just under five minutes, we'll be waiting for strong back retract. The arm that's currently propping the Falcon 9 and Dragon up will see the clamp arm start to open, and the strong back itself will tilt about two degrees off from where it is now at a 90 degree position. Just a little off, and then it'll get out of the way completely upon liftoff. Then, of course, comes the, uh, after the strong back retracts, comes the completion of liquid oxygen. Uh, loading on both the first and second stage. For now, T minus five minutes, 15 seconds. We're gonna stand by for that call of configuring for terminal count. Crew six in their seated positions and ready for launch. Dragon is in configure for terminal count. Thanks for pressurizing for strong battery check. All right, and we heard both of those calls. Dragon onboard computers are going to take control of the vehicle. We should be seeing the clamp arm at the very top of the second stage, right underneath where you see the unpressurized trunk of Dragon, which is indicated by the half black and half white indicators, the black being the solar panels that provide power to the Dragon on its transit to the International Space Station. Now that confirmation of strong back retract, we should be able to visually see that strong back. The strong back will retract about two degrees away from the vehicle. Then at liftoff, the strong back will actually go back to 45 degrees. That strong back is part of the transporter erector, which provides uh, the liquids and gases and uh, electrical connections to the vehicle. As Gary pointed out, those clamp arms opened up underneath the trunk, just above the first stage. And you can see that action happening now as that initial retraction just a couple degrees away from the vehicle. At this point in time, fueling remains underway, excuse me, propellant load remains underway. All fuels are loaded, that RP-1 um, liquid oxygen load Stage should- one, lock flow complete. There, we just heard that call out that that is all done. Second stage, lock load still underway. That will wrap up at about T minus two minutes. Now that that first stage liquid oxygen uh, load is complete. We'll see um, some more of that white gaseous cloud forming around the vehicle uh, due to those lines being Dragon closed off. Dragon is in terminal count and on internal power. All right, good call out there indicating that Dragon is running on its own power. We are in the terminal count now at T minus two minutes and 29 seconds. The crew remains comfortable there on the right-hand side of your screen. About 15 seconds remaining in stage two locks load. Stage two, lock flow complete. Okay. Dragon is in auto idle. You heard those calls. The Falcon 9 fully fueled with RP-1 rocket fuel as well as the liquid oxygen. That call of Dragon is in auto idle. There's going to be a se series Gas of calls. Started. 
Backweiser. There's the gas closeout purging the lines of the fuel that has supplied the Falcon 9 with RP-1 and liquid oxygen. We'll also wait for a call of the arming of the flight termination system. The Dragon flight computers are configured for launch. Flight termination system will allow Falcon 9 to talk to Dragon on the ride uphill. Terminate the flight, Falcon issuing an abort. Startup. Dragon is in countdown. T minus one minute and counting. Dragon is in countdown. Everything's looking good for launch. Dragon, SpaceX, go for launch. SpaceX, Dragon, copy, go for launch. T minus 30 seconds. T minus 30 seconds and counting. All teams pulled, go. Fifteen seconds. Ready for an on-time launch for the instantaneous one. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Engines full power and lift off. The crew six. Go dragon. Go power. Vehicles pitching down range, 1.7 million pounds of thrust provided by the nine Merlin 1D engines on the first stage. Hearing good calls, stage one propulsion is nominal. One Bravo. That one Bravo indicator are different abort modes that are called that allow the ground teams and the crew to track about the position of the Falcon 9 and the Dragon as they make their way up the eastern seaboard. In the event of an abort, these different abort modes would indicate about the position where Dragon would land, started. as well as uh, indicate what series of maneuvers Dragon would indicate. But so far, we're hearing good calls on the performance of the Falcon 9 on its ride uphill. One minute, 53 seconds into flight. We're about 30 seconds away from main engine cutoff, which will be followed quickly by stage separation and second engine start, which is the ignition of that MVAC engine on the second stage. Now about 10 seconds away from main engine cutoff. Two alpha. Copy, two Stage alpha. Stage separation confirmed. There you can see on your screen confirmation of stage separation as well as ignition of that second stage engine. Second stage is now carrying the Crew-6 astronauts to orbit. Beautiful view there on the left-hand side of your screen coming from the first stage, which as you can see is still gaining an altitude. It has not yet uh, reached its apogee. A beautiful view of the Florida Space Coast there in the background. Meanwhile, we're tracking good performance on that MVAC engine on the screen to your right. We'll be hearing periodic performance calls about once every minute 
with the status of the trajectory of the second stage and the Crew-6 astronauts that are inside Crew Dragon Endeavor. We'll also be yeah, hearing call outs. Just like you heard just there, as we pass over the various ground stations along the ascent track. Dragon, SpaceX, nominal trajectory. And there's that performance call out. Dragon acknowledges nominal trajectory. As for the first stage there on the left-hand side of your screen, that first stage still gaining an altitude, although um, that gain is slowing down. Um, it will be making its way back down to Earth, landing, uh, attempting a, a landing on our drone ship. Just read the instructions, which is located um, off the Florida coast by a couple hundred miles. The MVAC engine on stage two burns for six minutes after second stage ignition. We'll continue to see this engine burn until about eight and a half minutes into today's flight. Dragon, SpaceX, nominal trajectory. SpaceX, Dragon, nominal trajectory. Again, these performance calls happen once a minute. Flight teams continuing to track the Falcon 9 and its ascent. Everything's looking good so far. You'll also continue to hear those check-ins of the ground stations as we pass them. At this point in time, we're roughly two minutes away from the next major event, which will be the entry burn for the first stage. We will relight three engines, uh, three M1D engines on that first stage to help slow the vehicle down uh, as it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. We're approaching 200 kilometers in altitude. It's about 124 miles. Meanwhile, velocity. Dragon, SpaceX, nominal trajectory. Good trajectory calls. About to pass 12,000 kilometers per hour. Dragon, nominal trajectory. It's about 7,500 miles per hour. Everything looking nominal for both first and second stages. Now coming up to T plus six and a half minutes into flight. Mostly what we're hearing now are the performance calls in the second stage. In about a minute is when we'll see uh, a series of events in rapid succession. It's been a pretty good pace since second stage ignition. Uh, about a, uh, less than a minute from now, we'll start to see Dragon, more action SpaceX, on the first stage. Nominal trajectory. SpaceX Dragon, nominal trajectory. As Gary mentioned, those callouts occurring about once every minute. Now we're about 20 seconds away from the first stage entry burn. That burn will last about 30 seconds and help slow the vehicle down as it re-enters back into the Earth's atmosphere. Stage one entry burn startup. And there you can see stage two, FTS has saved. on your screen that first stage entry burn has begun. That booster sees high drag, which actually scrubs roughly 70% of the velocity by the time that the landing burn begins. So about another 10 seconds of this entry burn. Again, three engines relit, the center and two Stage radio one, engines. And conclusion of that entry burn. Meanwhile, good performance on the second stage. Since second stage ignition, we've been in a two alpha abort mode. The next abort modes will happen in rapid succession to Bravo, to Charlie, Delta, Terminal and Echo. Guidance each indicating different series of maneuvers in the event of an abort scenario. But as you've been hearing through the periodic checks, we're seeing good trajectory, good performance on the Dragon and Falcon 9. Seco, second stage engine cutoff, would be coming 
at 8 minutes 48 seconds. We're coming up on that event. Prince of Dragon, Shannon. Shannon. Copy, Shannon. Now off the coast of Shannon, Ireland. Standing by for Seco. MVAC shut down. Page one landing burn. And there we heard the call out indicating that landing burn. Dragon, SpaceX, we have a nominal orbit insertion. Great news there for. SpaceX Dragon copies nominal orbital insertion. Launch escape system disarmed. For Dragon Endeavor. Page one landing leg deployed. Attempting to land on our drone ship. Just read the instructions. And there you can see on your screen, and also indicated by the cheers behind me, successful landing of this booster. It's first trip to space, and therefore it's first landing. An eruption of applause here at SpaceX Mission Control. And of course, after second stage engine cutoff, you heard that call that the crew is in orbit. They're now in a coast phase where the second stage remains idle uh, for about three minutes before Dragon separates from the second stage. Meanwhile, you can see that first stage in the legs right on target. We're now getting views from the second stage. You can see this is one of the cameras that's pointing up into the trunk of Dragon. Of course, we're continuing to get views of the expansion nozzle at the end of the MVAC engine. But the crew is in orbit. The Falcon 9 has almost done its job. It completed its job uh, with propelling the astronauts through the six minutes of the second stage and, of course, the more than two and a half minutes of the first stage. Continuing in this coast period. We're heading to about the 12 minute mark after launch. So we're approaching 11 minutes right now, but it's great to see the crew in orbit. Uh, of course, we are waiting for that step separation. You can see this view right here of the MVAC engine, the second stage really in just an idle position, really just coasting, not many commands being issued from the Falcon 9. But of course, at the very end, we'll actually issue the command for separating the Dragon from the Falcon 9. You'll see a series, you may see a series of burns. The Draco engines uh, on the service section of the Draco will fire and uh, increase uh, separation distance from the second stage. Once again, live view there from the second stage looking up into the trunk, which of course is the unpressurized section um, that goes along with the Dragon capsule to the International Space Station. That's where we are able to store uh, basically cargo that is able to be exposed to the vacuum of space. So a great view there looking up into the trunk. That will be hopefully the first views that we get um, of that separation event, which we're expecting here uh, any second. There you can see on your screen confirmation. Dragon separation confirmed. Of that separation confirmed. Dragon Endeavor is now floating free in space. That's right, the Falcon Dragon 9. Dragon CE here. Welcome to orbit. Congratulations. Your flight is exactly four years after the flight of the Demo 1 mission. Like Andre said, all the best things take two tries. Happy that we could get you off tonight. Uh, if you enjoyed your ride, please don't forget to give us five stars. Over to LD for some words. Also, a friendly reminder to put your sushi orders in for CRS-27. Have a safe ride to the space station, and we look forward to seeing you when you get home. Thank you for flying SpaceX. Back to the losses, you know, Bermuda. And SpaceX Dragon copies all. That was fantastic. Thank you. The Crew-6 astronauts, of course, uh, having a strong bond. And SpaceX Dragon, we'd like to really go the great ride to orbit today. Uh, it was greatly appreciated. May have taken two rides, but it's two times, but it was worth the trip. 
And uh, I guess I'll pass it over to Woody for some words. Yeah, SpaceX Dragon, just want to say as a rookie flyer, that was one heck of a ride. Thank you. I would say put it as an absolute miracle of engineering, and I just feel so lucky that I get to fly on this amazing machine. Thanks to SpaceX, thanks to NASA, commercial crew program, and our international partners. Um, a lot of innovation went into this, tireless work effort, and a lot of painstaking attention to detail and focus on testing. And I think that's what makes it all possible to fly humans in space. Thank you. Some really nice words. Uh, Международной команды, как Международной космической станции, работая вместе на благо всего человечества. Well said, everybody. Uh, allow me to say a few words in Arabic first. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah wa salam al fada. Bas baghayt ashkar ummi wa boy wa ashkar aylti. Shukran al qiyad al rashida. Wa shukran li merkaz Muhammad bin Rashid al fada. Li atoni al thiqa hadi. Wa kadalik ashkar kul man jahazna wa darabna. Li hadi al lahda al tarikhiya. Min mukhtalaf wakalat al fada fi anha al alam. شكرا لكم جزيلا شكرا سبيسيك لإصارنا الفضاء I would like to say thank you to, for everybody thanks to my parents my family thanks to our leadership the Mohammed Barash Space Center for their trust thank you for everybody who trained us and got us ready for this mission this is incredible launch with incredible amazing thank you so much and last but not least, thank you, NASA. Thank you, SpaceX, for flying us to space. Go Dragon, go SpaceX. And allow me to introduce our fifth crew member. His name is Suhail, and Suhail is the Arabic name for the star Canobus. And in the Middle East, we anticipate the appearance of Canobus because it marks the end of summer and the beginning of cool time. And Canopus is actually the second brightest star in the night sky. And this is the second flight for uh, Suhail, because he flew with uh, astronaut Hazan Mansouri in 2019. And many people think Suhail is uh, an, al an alien, but to me, on Earth in a space suit, but with high ambitions. Thank you once again, and talk to you from the ISS. And Dragon SpaceX, we copy all those words. Uh, at this time, I can provide you an update that uh, we had nominal dehumidifier activation and service section Draco checkouts. Uh, for your awareness, uh, on hard capture hook five, we did swap to backup motors. So you'll see that the uh, nose cone opening did swap to backup. However, all hooks did indicate that they were traveling and look good on backup. Acquisition signal. All right. Very dynamic time. Um, of course, uh, Falcon 9 delivering the Crew 6 astronauts into orbit after the nine minute ascent. We heard those great congratulatory words from each and every member of Crew 6, who of course had a strong bond with the teams here in uh, Mission Control and SpaceX. 
Uh, that call you did here to the crew was about the nose cone. Uh, the nose cone is deploying now. They were troubleshooting an issue with one of the hooks, but switched to backup motors, and we're seeing that nose cone deploy now. Uh, but Crew 6 is now on its way to the International Space Station. It's going to take about 24 and a half hours. So they'll go through a series of checks, a series of initial burns, and then eventually have a sleep period before waking up and really getting into the action uh, with a lot of the burns that bring it closer and closer to the International Space Station. It'll be docking to the Zenith port. We're now getting views from the Dragon, and that's the nose cone deploying that you're seeing right now on the end of the Dragon. And Kate, this really sets the uh, crew up for some of the major burns here, that nose cone deploying reveals the four forward bulkhead Dracos that do a lot of the heavy lifting, a lot of those significant burns that bring the crew closer to the International Space Station. That's right. The nose cone is basically the pointy end at the top of Dragon. So now with that being exposed, those forward bulkhead thrusters uh, will be able to do their job um, as Dragon Endeavor makes its way to the International Space Station. Um, just prior to losing the ground station coverage, we were able to catch a quick glimpse of the zero-G indicator. Um, I always love seeing that be revealed uh, as it's always different for each crew and it's always special to the crew members. Um, so I love the words that were shared around that. And I personally have a strong connection to this Capsule. This was the Demo 2 capsule, the Crew 2 capsule, the Axiom 1 capsule, and now the Crew 6 capsule. And so um, it always brings a, a lot of uh, pride and joy to see this particular capsule fly in space safely once again. So with all that being said, let's head back over to Daryl and Raja, who saw all of the, the, the liftoff action live. You guys, I bet it was incredible having seen it from the press site myself a couple of times. I know you can feel it. Tell us how it was to see this crew lift off. Absolutely, Kate, and uh, thank you for the toss back here to the Kennedy Space Center. And on that point, we got to get Raj's reaction first because it was his first launch. He's he's been on a <laughs> rocket. He's been to space. Let's see the outside. First time watching a launch. Yeah, that, that was awesome, Daryl. Uh, it was uh, better than I expected. So I think uh, much uh, a much more throaty rumbling sound once it started to pitch over uh, and a beautiful night here so we could see the second stage light we could actually see the throttle down for uh, from stage one to stage B which was really cool uh, saw the separation saw the light go out when the first stage separated saw the second stage light and got to watch it uh, all, pretty much all the way to two Bravo it was it was pretty impressive to so two that, Bravo yeah. we're, we're, sorry those are those are different launch escape phases so yeah it was uh, it was awesome seeing it from the ground and just kind of thinking through what that ride was like a while ago. But, uh, I'd, ra I'd rather be on the inside than the outside, <laughs> but it's pretty- In here with us. <laughs> but it's pretty, it's pretty impressive uh, from both views. Yeah, it was, well, it we're was so cool glad to we see them. And exciting, that, yeah, exciting that they're on the way to the space station. So um, happy for them. No doubt, congratulations to not only the crew that is getting up into space, but also everyone who helped make it possible. It takes an, an, a tremendous number of people in order to pull that off. And that roar, right? When did you feel it in your chest? Yeah, so on the, the day of, the, you can, yeah, here, it, it, you can feel it there and you can feel it here. You'd actually feel the vibration. They can actually bodily, you know, it's actually vibrating your body, Visceral, the, the, the yeah. ground around you. And I think just the coolness of it, almost, it's almost daytime around the launch pad when it first lit, just with the humidity, uh, the temperature dew point spread right now, there's a lot of moisture in the air. So just the reflection of the light, you actually couldn't even see the top of the rocket. It was the, flame, the, the plume lit up the whole horizon. So basically as far as you could see, 180 degrees here, just looked like daylight for the first about 20 seconds. So it was really, really cool. Well, your first launch, watching. Yep, I'll be back Sir? again. Yeah, we're ready to see another one. <laughs> we love it. Fantastic. All right, um, as I mentioned before, we got to the you know terminal count and ascent. I said there was a little bit of love in the air, right? Well, why is that? Well, a gentleman by the name of Sabi Farouk brought his girlfriend to the Banana Creek launch viewing location and proposed to her right at liftoff. They're both from Denver. We have a picture, and there it is. There's Sabi and his girlfriend. Now fiance. And now fiance, yeah. Tamori. And she's sporting the ring. Congratulations to them. What a, what a special thing to do. He had planned out this because during their, uh, when they first met, 
they had their first kiss at a rocket launch. And so he wanted to bring <laughs> her back to propose, and it happened right here at the NASA Kennedy Space Center. What a neat love That's story, a cool, huh? Yeah, what a great story, yeah. Congratulations to both of them. And so now, let's turn it over to Jasmine, who is with a special guest with some post-launch reaction. Jasmine. Thank you so much, Daryl. Here on the balcony of OSB2, we had a great view of launch and the crowd around us just erupted in cheers. It lit up the night sky. Joining us now is Kennedy Space Center Deputy Center Director Kelvin Manning. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's great to be here, Jasmine. We are so glad to have you. And Kelvin, first question is easy. What did you think of launch? It was spectacular. And <laughs> anytime we're putting people on a rocket makes it even more special. So. We launched satellites, we launched all kinds of things, but tonight it was Steve, Woody, Sultan, and Andre um, watching them walk out, saying goodbye to their families, and uh, for us to get them off safely onto the International Space Station, that's a huge accomplishment. It really is a huge accomplishment. Daryl just mentioned love in the air, and we saw that great proposal at uh, Banana Creek, and Commercial Crew is really the perfect marriage of our commercial and our international partners. Isn't that right, Kelvin? Absolutely. So government, industry, and, and international partners, it's kind of like a modern day what we strive to have like Star Trek. You have all these people from different planets and uh, we're just getting started here. So maybe one day we'll have uh, people from other planets as well. <laughs> We really are just kicking things off. And you mentioned, you know, that the astronauts flying on today's mission and that you've actually uh, been on the selection panel for a few of the astronaut classes before. One of those was the turtles. So pretty exciting for you to get to see uh, Woody fly today, right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, special guy and uh, really looking forward to seeing him on orbit and then getting him back home and, and hearing his stories. Yeah, we're, we're looking forward to having him back as well as uh, the rest of Crew 6. And this was really a great way to kick off the launches of 2023. We mentioned earlier with Janet Petro that we are looking at over 90 launches this year. So what else is going to station in the next few months? Okay, we got a cargo resupply mission, CRS-27. We have uh, Boeing's inaugural flight of the uh, crew flight test, uh, looking for Sonny and Butch. To sometime this spring to fly the CST-100 Starliner to station. That's a huge deal. And we got uh, another commercial uh, Axia mission that'll go to the, the space station. And then we'll look at Crew 7 to follow these guys in another six months or so. Wow, a lot of work going on here at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, Kelvin, any final words of thanks that you want to give to the workforce here? Yeah, it's all about the team. And this is America's space program. You talked about our industry partners, our other government partners, and our international partners. Uh, we have a lot to be proud of. And like we said, we're just getting started. So thank you, Jasmine. Of course, and this really is the dream team. We appreciate you being here tonight, Kelvin. Okay, All right, thank you. Daryl, back to you. Thank you so much, Jasmine. And you see her working the love in there with the CCP. <laughs> well done, thank you very much. Well, the crew is on the way to the International Space Station. We did hear uh, from the SpaceX team that the nose cone hooks at the top of the spacecraft, right? Yep. The Dragon, um, they went to the backup motors in order to release that nose cone. That's pretty critical to make sure you get that up. Great redundancy with the system there. But why is that so important that that nose cone comes off? Yeah, so we you can't dock to the space station without the nose cone. So the as we saw, just looking at the views of the capsule before uh, liftoff, it's closed for aerodynamics because you don't want a uh, door wide open while, you, while you're flying through the air. Once you're in space, of course, there's no drag, so then you can open that up. Um, and uh, that exposes the camera and the sensors that allow the Dragon to dock with the International Space Station. There's a whole lot of stuff going on, so the crew was working the comms back down to the ground and monitoring a whole bunch of systems, so we saw the separation. Uh, they have telemetry that gives them information about that, and then uh, the next step is the nose cone deploy, and as you heard the core mention, all of those hooks, uh, there's a dozen hooks, to, uh, six of them uh, are holding the nose cone, there's, and then basically each of those hooks has backup and primary motors, so what you heard them describe is one of those went onto the backup motor to open the hook, which is why we have backup motors. Uh, now with the nose cone open, they should be good to continue to the uh, the space station. Um, and next thing they'll be talking about is, is phasing burns, so we, you know, how they have to catch up. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure there'll be teams looking at uh, the data from that to see if it was kind of like we talked about earlier in the broadcast, was it actually a problem with the primary motor or was it just a bad telemetry? Uh, so the ground has some ability to, to suss that out with some extra data they have. They can try resetting things. So my guess is when they go to actually Docking, they may retry that 
primary motor just to see if it's working, and then they have the backup oh. motor still as a, an option. Um, so they still have the redundancy, but uh, they'll sort through uh, maybe troubleshooting that some more, but I don't think it should affect the, the follow-on. So those on. hooks are used when they dock? Right, the same, yeah, the same hooks. Uh, there's Mechanism. a soft capture and a hard capture, a hard hook system that attaches under the space station. But again, as long as hard capture, a hard hook system that attaches under the space station. But again, as long as the backup motor's working, it should be fine. Should be good to go. Yep. All right, well, we will track it all along the way and we know we saw a visual confirmation of the nose cone coming off. Yep. Saw that right on the video with the cameras that SpaceX has. And so now, Stephen, Woody, Sultan, and Andre are on course to arrive at the International Space Station around 1.17 a.m. Eastern Time tomorrow. And of course, NASA TV will be wrapping up our coverage, but you can follow along with Crew-6's entire ride to the station and hear real-time audio from space to ground on our mission audio stream on YouTube. Just look for the link on NASA social media accounts and in the description of the NASA YouTube launch broadcast. And though our coverage here at Kennedy Space Center is concluding, Crew-6's mission has only just begun. And you know it well, Raja, when you go up into the International Space Station, you really enjoyed the ride getting there because that's when the work starts. Exactly, yeah. So it's actually a really nice period of time here. You got some time to look out the window, uh, enjoy your time. You spend a lot of time in the sim, the Dragon sim, whether it's out at Hawthorne or the, the ones out in Houston. Um, but it's nice to actually you know, now enjoy the ride uh, and take it all in, especially for the, the three rookies. Get used to some space adaptation, moving around in, in microgravity before you get on the space station. Because as soon as you show up in the space station, man, it is busy. <laughs> it is fun, but it is busy. Time to get to work. Next up is our post-launch news conference scheduled for 2.30 a.m. Eastern Time on NASA TV. We'll have a live joint docking coverage. Uh, of Crew 6. We'll have the welcome ceremony starting at 11 p.m. Eastern Time tonight. Uh, this is, is this will be on Thursday on NASA TV as well as SpaceX's YouTube channel. And you can find mission updates on Twitter, at NASA, at SpaceX, and on the web at nasa.gov, including that link. We'll have it in there in the description of the mission audio stream if you want to stick with Crew-6 during their entire journey to the space station. Well, before we want to sign off here at Kennedy, I want to thank Raja Chari for being on the launch broadcast and sharing your incredible experiences. I learned such an incredible amount. I hope our audience did too. You answered all their questions and it was fascinating <laughs> just to listen to all the things that happened. Really appreciate well, you being here. Thanks. I'm glad I got a chance to see a rocket launch. And so, yeah, I highly recommend coming here to do this. You can get a great view of a rocket launch. It's the way to go. Great plug for the Kennedy Space Center there, Roger. We appreciate that. And good luck to you on your work with the HLS. You're doing uh, a lot of work there with the human landing system for the Artemis program. And people are really excited about that. Yeah, they should be. It's, it is an amazing time. We've, we're seeing what we're doing in low Earth orbit, and that is just the first step. Man, We are going back to the moon to stay and on to Mars, and it is a great time to be in space. Congratulations on watching your first launch, and congratulations to the space lovebirds out there at the <laughs> Kennedy Space Center who tied, or at least had, had the proposal and got a big yes. And then, of course, thanks to all of our guests for joining us today. We really appreciate you watching. You is you are why we do this, right? So here now are some highlights from the journey to orbit off the Earth for the Earth. For Rajachari and everyone here at the NASA Kennedy Space Center, I'm Daryl Nail. Have a great night and keep looking up. Crew 6 on the move inside astronaut crew quarters. Crew 6 walking outside of astronaut crew quarters for the second time. Andre Fedyev. Woody Hoberg, Stephen Bowen, and Sultan al -Niyan. The crew departing the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building, a full security escort across NASA's Kennedy Space Center to launch pad 39A. The commander and pilot, Stephen and Woody, making their way inside Dragon. There go our two mission specialists as they cross the hatch, being very careful five-point harness just to save wear and tear on the suits. A lot of times the ground crew will, will help with doing that. As we watch the SpaceX closeout crew close the hatch to the Dragon capsule. Three, two, one. It is full power and lift off. Crew six, go Dragon, go power. Down range, 1.7 million pounds of thrust.
Northwest. Wi-Fi 9, Robin with the engines in the first stage. Hearing good calls, stage one propulsion is nominal. 